Hey there, fight friends. MMA Andy Cotterell here with proper Mike Malott. Mike, how are you? Good, thanks. How you doing, buddy? Super duper. We have our matching Vietnamese coffees here. Mike introduced me to it. It's fantastic. Try it out. Um, so today we're going to be talking with Mike about a few things. Uh, uh, actually, a, a promotional organization reached out to me to speak with Mike about the Skilled Trades College and their partnership with the Ultimate Fighting Championship. So we're going to talk about that. And afterwards, we're going to talk about Mike's upcoming uh, November 2nd fight in Edmonton and some other things as well. And uh, I'm really happy that, Mike, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. I always appreciate you putting in that effort. So uh, it means a lot to me. So Skilled Trades College, could you tell us a little bit about this partnership between the UFC and Skilled Trades College of Canada? Yeah, it seems like kind of a no-brainer partnership. Like, it's a bunch of hardworking guys in the UFC and a bunch of hardworking guys for Skilled Trades College, and uh, they just provide opportunities and education for young people to learn skills to make a future for themselves and, and take careers into their own hands and, and, and create new paths and avenues for themselves. And, uh, you know, again, it's, you know, I work with my hands, they work with their hands. I think it just kind of makes a lot of sense working together. Yeah, 100%. And you know, it's, it's forcing me to think about this in a new perspective because historically, you, we tend to think of jobs as either blue collar or white collar. And ju just overgeneralization, blue collar is working with your body in some capacity, and white collar is sitting behind a desk working with your brain. And I, I don't think we can really call a mixed martial artist a blue collar worker because it's a very cerebral job, right? Like you can't be a dummy and, and be victorious in the, in the cage. You might win a fight or two, but you're not going to have a long career. So in order to be successful, you, you have to co combine physical excellence with mental excellence. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, there's a little blue collar in there, but it's a little more red collar, you know, just uh, <laughs> get the blood on the shirt and that's the way she goes. But yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a cool partnership we're, we're doing with SDC. I love what those guys have to say. You know, they, they give back to the community really well, which is something that's important to me. And, and uh, especially with, you know, not to get too far down the rabbit hole of, of politics and stuff with the future trends in like AI and job replacements. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. How do, you, how do you navigate the next 40 years of your life? Like what skills do you think are going to get you to where you want to be? It's like skilled trades are always going to be in high demand. They're always going to be extremely useful jobs, you know. So I think... Uh, I think it's a great thing to, to partner with those guys and uh, promote that with, with UFC fans. Yeah, for sure. Had you not become a mixed martial artist, a professional mixed martial artist, are there any kind of blue collar trades or skilled trades that you, you think would have interested you? Well, before I started fighting, I worked kind of my, my summers between school were always, uh, I was a yard laborer at McNally Construction in Hamilton. So I was kind of a gopher just with all the mechanics, like, hey man, we're out of bolts, go pick some up. Or like, hey, these things need to be like, moved so i was just more the you know the 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 grunt worker and just kind of helping people out but uh yeah i i was always interested in what they could do like bring in it was it was heavy machinery so it was like you know guys were working on cranes guys were working on you know backhoes guys were working on stuff that would go off to job sites and i thought it was cool that they could take something that was broken or needed fixing and you know do the diagnostics and figure out what was wrong with it and and repair it and have it sent back off to a shop I think that's really cool like my my dad wasn't my dad was a construction worker an engineer and, and has been in that that company and industry for a long time so he wasn't like a trades worker per se but he's always been able to fix everything and I admire that about him and guys that like are good at fixing things that that you need every day I, I admire when people can do stuff like that because I'm not great at it I'm like so I'm moderately handy around the house but if, if there's a, something that actually needs to be fixed I need to call somebody yeah. So it's like when someone can come and fix something like that at my, at my place, I'm like, damn, man, like, I would like to know that. But uh, I don't know. The, we had an electrician at the house to, to set some stuff up for me, a buddy of mine, uh, Oscar. He, uh, he, he helped me out at the house. Electri being an electrician, I think would be pretty cool. Yeah, it would be. There's a few things like I've become handy over the years by necessity, and YouTube is your friend, and that way you can learn how to do so. Like I've learned how to change my brakes, oil change, all that stuff. The one thing, I, even though I'm learning about it, I just want to avoid is, is electrical. Yeah, I, I don't think that's a DIY type thing. I think you need to know what you're doing with stuff yeah. like that. Like you're gonna get yourself killed or or or, uh, or get yourself hurt. I saw a video on uh, on Instagram recently, and it was this guy, like an actual electrician, looking at like a box in somebody's house. And he's talking to this elderly woman who owns the house, and he's like, uh, he's like, so who did this box previously? And then he takes like, I guess it was some sort of like heat scanner and puts it over yeah, top of the box. Yeah. And one of the, one of the 
one of the things is like red hot, I guess. Yeah. He's like, who, who did your box? She's like, oh, my nephew did it. He's very handy. He's like, oh, okay. When did his house burn down? She's like, oh, his house burned down a few years ago. Wait a minute. How did you know that? And he's like, because your fucking house is about to burn down. Yeah. Like, don't DIY that. Like, learn what you're doing, you know, yeah. or no, yeah. le le learn it if you're going to do that stuff, right? Yeah, for sure. And this, this uh, conversation right now is really timely because I think it was just yesterday or the day before I saw a meme on Instagram that said something like, construction worker is the is the best solid foundation core to be a, a pro mixed martial artist and they had a picture of Marab with a, uh, a hard hat on and uh, Demetrius Johnson with a hard hat on so it's those kind of things that sort of sculpt your body and get it ready for the punishment that you have to endure inside the cage yeah I mean there's a lot of just like hand in hand grit like they're long days man like uh, you know I, I again I, I did a little bit of that yard laboring and I, I was kind of like a a carpenter's assistant as well and did a lot of carpentry stuff just like studying a building kind of helped with an expansion on uh, the offices that were being done at that at that spot and just you know it's long days man especially I think it put you know made me a bit more of a man because that was the first summer that I also started training with Cruella in Halmagen mm -hmm. so I'd go to that work all day I'd get there for work at 7 a.m. We'd finish up at 5, and then I'd drive over to Cruise for 5.30, and I'd train from 5.30 to 9 there, get the shit kicked out of me by Shane Campbell and yeah. Will Romero and Jeff Sharkey and all those guys that, that, were, that were there back in the day and wake up and do the same thing the next day. And uh, I didn't do a whole lot those summers other than go to work and get my ass kicked, but I was, like, the happiest kid in the world. I'm like, yeah. you're telling me I can yeah. train with these guys and learn how to actually fight and learn wrestling from, from uh, you know, Adrian Woolley and, and Crew L you know, striking from Crew in so... Yeah, definitely. all killers. Yeah, it definitely toughened me up. I went from being kind of like a little, you know, I was athletic and I was I was scrappy, but I, I needed a little bit of that to toughen me up, you know. Yeah, for sure. I've seen pictures of of you when you were a very young man. I think you were like twelve or something like that, and you've sure come a long way. Yeah, yeah. No, I was I was always the runt growing up. Just funny, like uh, I think I had a little bit of that small man syndrome, and that's kind of what got me into the sport. Like I, I've always loved the idea of being able to navigate combat, I think just it's so inherently chaotic that learning how to handle and like almost contain that chaos is, is attractive to me. It's both physically and in, in a mental way. I, th I think it's like a kind of like a puzzle that fights you back, you know, and I, and I like that. It's a puzzle that tries to solve you before you solve it. And that's, that's something that's very attractive to me as far as like attracting me to the sport. I haven't heard it expressed before as control the chaos, but I have heard similar uh, viewpoints, that sort of idea. I'm wondering though, like, well, of course, that's why you train so much, right? You're training hardcore all the time, not every day, but almost every day. And every day you're at least thinking about it some capacity, doing some mental training. I wonder if that chaos can be controlled or if that's just an illusion and if that's something that you're ever going to come to a realization, like not just you, but any fighter. Do you ever come to that realization that's just something, the fight game itself is not something I can beat. I might win the fight, but I'm not, I, I can't be a winner over the fight game. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like chasing perfection. Like you're never going to achieve perfection. You're never going to truly contain that chaos or control that chaos. But I think some people, especially early on in their careers, think of MMA as like, I'm going to do martial arts because that's fighting. Martial arts aren't fighting. Martial arts are strategies and techniques and ideas you can use in a chaotic fight to try and lessen the danger, to try and lessen the chaos, to try and control somebody or the opposite. Somebody's really controlled and technical and you can increase the chaos. I was telling my boy Jared, who's sitting over here right now, that he did a great job of making it chaotic and making it a little bit scrappy today and I was like yes man that was fucking awesome do that that was you, you did a great job today so and that's something that we were talking about in the uh, Niagara top team earlier on today uh sitting down the bench you were talking about how when you're shadow boxing you're trying to not just give that pretty boy pose I think you called it where you're just stationary in front of your opponent you know you're always moving around and creating those challenges and angles for them to have to figure out themselves yeah I think it was just we we're talking about like a balance of of trying to create movements and sequences and patterns that lead to advantageous outcomes without being restrictive, without like trying to mm -hmm. put yourself in a mold that isn't you. Like, mm -hmm. And again, that's the same thing as like chasing that chaos. I don't think it'll ever be perfect. I think there will be times when I'm maybe a little bit more technical and I'm pulling away from what feels natural. And sometimes I'll maybe be a little bit more instinctive and natural, which 
may at times pull away from technical or, or um, yeah, technical and safe uh, engagements, I guess. I'm finding this very interesting. Uh, but I want to move on just because we could be here all day talking about that kind of thing. And I want to save that for another time. Um, but let's move on now to your upcoming fight. November 2nd, you're fighting at Edmonton. Talk to us about this fight. Yeah, I'm just happy to get back in there, man. Like, thinking about it even today, you know, I do a lot of journaling. And one thing I'm, you know, is I, I write about sometimes and I need to remind myself. It's like, dude, you're in the UFC. Like, you've wanted to do this since you were 12 years old. Like, this is really, really cool. You know, so... There's always pressure, and, and it's healthy to put a little bit of pressure on yourself, and it's it's healthy to feel that this is a big moment, and that I there's a desired outcome, or one of several desired outcomes as far as like the way to finish the fight or the way to win. But also, man, enjoy this shit. Don't don't just get through this camp. Don't just get through fight day. Don't just get through fight week. Enjoy it, man. This will be gone for me one day. I won't always have fighting as an athlete. So soak this up while I have the opportunity, you know? That's a great lesson. I, I spoke with Jasmine after her first ever UFC fight, not the Contender Series fight, her first UFC fight. And I asked her something like, what would you do differently? And she told me, I'm paraphrasing, that she would have spent more time just pausing and soaking it in and enjoying it because it was such a blur. I had uh, Danny Castillo in my corner for my, my debut. I love that guy. He's, he had 24 fights with Zufa, I think, and 16 of them were in the UFC. Eight were in um, WEC, I believe. And that was what he was adamant about all week. He's like, look, I know there's a lot of feelings that happen fight week, and especially on fight day, you're going to feel like you kind of just want to get the day over with. He's like, you only get one UFC debut. He's like, you'll never get this again. It'll be gone for you forever after this. Soak it up. Make sure you feel these moments and you know, like, make sure you appreciate these moments. And my mental coach, Danny Patterson, talks about that type of stuff a lot, you know, in the present moment, soaking things up. Like, looking back on that day, I can even think about driving to Vistar Arena in Jacksonville, Florida, and how the Maxwell Coffee factory is just down the street. So the street on a hot day smelled very richly like coffee, right, like coffee beans and coffee grounds and that's just like a cool little thing to think about to remember for the rest of my life I'm like oh yeah that ar that arena and like walking from the shuttle into the venue smelled very strong of that coffee oh yeah the curtains were closed before I walked out and it wasn't super dark in the back there were lights on in the back and the curtain was closed and I could hear the echo of the fans, but it wasn't blaringly loud. But then once the curtain opened and I walked out first and Fat Lip by Sum 41 came on, it was a lot louder and I could feel the energy. Excuse me, I could feel the energy in the arena and it got a lot darker as I walked in. And once it, it went from being like kind of like this type room where it's not dark, there's lights, but it's not well lit. Then you walk into absolute darkness and you pop out the other side into a spotlight that's just shining on you. And you hear the echo of your walkout song, but when you're walking through the tunnel, it echoes weird. And I'm like, are they playing the right song? And it took me halfway through my walkout to realize that they were playing Fat Lip by Sum 41. And then I started jamming out with it. But uh, yeah, cool little, cool little moments like that. Um, Dude, this, this coffee is getting me all jittery. And this, plus, like, remembering stuff, I'm getting all worked up, man. I feel, we'll like, I feel, like, I feel like I'm shaking. I'm definitely not having another, man. I'll fly home if I have another one. Yeah. When you look back at uh, events past in your life, including fighting but other things, you can see the videos, you can see the pictures. Are you able to recapture the memories from watching those, or is it just something that you have to really sit down and tell yourself to, to, to recreate in your, in, your, in your inner self? I think the further you get from those moments, you less you feel less of the feelings that you felt in that moment. You can always go back to it a little bit, but man, there's so much going on in your mind and body and a lot of it's trying to let that go and just let yourself be in the moment rather than forcing anything. But even like uh, one I can think back on was the night that you gave me my first MMA interview, yeah. uh, May of 2011. I think it was either May 20th, Sounds right. Yeah, May of 27th or 28th of, of 2011. I fought that night 
against a very tough kid, Michael Imperato, who just fought on Contender Series. He was 3-0 at the time. I was 1-0. We both took the fight on a week's notice. I had a massive cut to 145. Barely made weight. It was miserable. I was so nervous going into that one, and I ended up submitting him, and he was like a purple belt world champion or something like that. And I was like, you know, I was like an okay blue belt at the time, but I had a couple things that I was really good at, and the armbar from close guard was one of them, and I ended up armbarring him from close guard and uh, getting the submission first in the first round. And there are things that I remember from that night that you wouldn't pick up on when watching the video, but I remember distinctively because it was one of the most one of the most powerfully imprinted memories in my mind. I remember going for the arm bar. And I went to like high guard, locked his shoulder out of the arm lock and started pivoting. And once I got there, I was like, I think I'm gonna arm bar this guy. Threw the leg over top of his head and then I crossed my ankles, which is a big, don't big do no that, no. big no-no. But I was like, screw it, we've got it, I've got the arm. And I'm like, the main thing I need to worry about is 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 not letting him stack me he didn't stack me he picked me up and slammed me directly on my head but i was so excited that i had the armbar that i didn't even really notice it to be honest and i rolled through and i just bellied in on that armbar and felt some pops and a panic tap i'm like no way i just tapped this guy let's go and we had some words beforehand and he wasn't exactly polite before the fight so I, you know it was a little more emotional at the time as a 19 year old I got up after the tap and I go to look at my corner. It was in a ring, so I go to look in my actual corner. And I'm like, let's go, I'm about to scream to my, my corner. And it's his corner and I go, oh. And then I turn back around and Peter Martell, Peter McGrath and Rob Walker had all jumped over the, the ring and are like, yes, and ran and picked me up because they knew it was a tough fight. Like um, my coaches were out of town when I accepted the fight, the guy, who, um, uh, Ricky Goodall, was an old teammate of mine, and he was putting on the event, and he just needed another fight. And he's like, hey, man, um, I got a fight for you in a week. I can't afford to pay you and fly him in, so I need you to fight for free. Also, this guy's way tougher than the guy that you were going to fight who pulled out a while ago, um, but I need you to do it. And I was like, <laughs> I was like um, should I talk to Peter about it? And he's like, are you scared? And I was like, no, no, I'm not scared. And then like, he was, you know, one of the like more veterans on the team. So I didn't want to seem like a coward in front of him. So I'm like, oh yeah, I'll take it. And I was like, fuck, this is a tough fight. Like this guy's really good. I know who this guy is. He had trained with one of my buddies, Adrian Woolley, high level wrestler in the area. So I knew who he was. I'd never met him, but I knew he was high level and I beat him and I was like, yes, let's go. And it was like my Rocky Balboa moment where like Peter Martell picked me up and like carried me around the ring and Peter McGrath and Rob Walker like slapping me on the body. And then the commission's trying to like hold my whole team back. Because there's like three commissioners being like, guys, you can't go into the ring. And just all of Titans yeah. MMA just floods over, like a, a riot yeah. just floods over the ring. It's like, there's still like four or five fights in the night and everyone jumps over and they're like high-fiving and hugging. Cause <laughs> like they were all pumped for me. Cause me and Imperato got into it at weigh-ins and, and he was, you know, a little disrespectful and stuff. And so everyone was just psyched and, uh, yeah, just little things of like standing up and being like, oh, no, wait, that's not my corner turning around. And those guys already being there and picking me up and just feeling like the absolute man that night. That was that was one of the best nights of my life for sure. And then you interviewed me for the first time in my MMA career. Yeah. You and uh, Gavin Tucker the same night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was uh, Gavin Tucker and I had uh, our debut, or my debut on the same card as his second fight. His debut, I had the Muay Thai fight on that card. I think I had an opponent he pulled out, so I had a... Um, amateur Muay Thai fight on that card. So we had like, there were multiple cards where we fought on the same card, I believe. And it's funny, that's one of those things when I, I talk to, to fans, I always highly encourage people to, to watch amateur mixed martial arts. Amateur mix, not even amateur, amateur for sure, but like local MMA is what I say. So you have a small event somewhere, bunch of fighters you've never heard of before. You have an O&O fighter named Mike Malott, never heard of him, and look at him now, fighting November 2nd in the UFC for the, I don't know, like seventh UFC fight, sixth UFC fight? I count my contender series fight as a UFC fight. It was in the UFC cage. I had UFC glove, unbranded UFC gloves on. Dana White sitting there, it's in the apex. I count that as a UFC fight. So including that one, this will be, I'm four and one. This will be my sixth nice. UFC fight, yeah. Let's go back to November 2nd now. Sorry, Edmonton fight. So talk about your opponent for this fight and what you're doing to get ready for him, if anything, specifically. Yeah, I mean, I got a guy who's got a lot of fights in the UFC. You know, he's beaten seven UFC fighters. That's a 
pretty big deal, man. Like, this guy is dangerous. I've grappled him before, and he's a high-level grappler. He's a black belt in jiu-jitsu. I won that match about a year and a half ago. <clears throat> Where was that? That was in uh, Philadelphia for Fury Grappling on uh, not New Year's Eve, but the day before. Yeah. It was an odd one where, like, I didn't have an, any fights. I'm like, you know, am I going to get a fight? Whatever. My manager's like, ah, they don't have anything for you right now. Stay ready. Do you want to do this grappling match? I'm like, hell yeah, let's do it. You know, took, we, we, we both kind of took that on like a week's notice or whatever. So it was not like there was a, a camp that went into it. Or maybe maybe two or three weeks, actually. It was a bit of a training camp going into it. But uh, the, I think the week of the match, he's like, oh, also, here's your UFC fight in seven weeks. And I'm like, shit, what if I go into this dumbass grappling match? Like, no, not dumbass. Like, I love Fury grappling. It's yeah, sick. Yeah. But I'm like, what if I do this, like, for fun grappling match? Like and, match. yeah, and get yeah. an injury and then have to either pull out of this fight or, or it, it um, impacts my next training camp, which is exactly what happened. I'm not gonna say what it was that happened, but there was something that happened about halfway through the match that completely changed how I had to grapple yeah. against him. And so I took a lot less risks and just started hand fighting. Yeah. Um, and there was one thing leading up to it the week before that, that got tweaked and I was like, okay, don't do this other thing that you were gonna do. Like, a big part of it so it wasn't a super exciting match not a whole lot happened um, I had a couple submission attempts I took his back I went for like a jumping guillotine and he slammed me um, but yeah so I've, I've at least grabbed a hold of the guy like part of it part of the anxiety of fighting is like oh man what's this guy gonna feel like yeah yeah I mean he's he's a strong guy he feels like a welterweight he feels like a guy who belongs in the UFC yeah I'm not like, oh, Jesus, this can't hit the ground. Or like, yeah. do not let this guy grab a hold of you, you know? Um, I think that's probably a, a tricky balance, trying to maintain that, that mindset between I know I'm good, I know I deserve to be here, I know I belong to, to be a UFC fighter, and also getting too far ahead of yourself saying, I'm a very good UFC fighter and nobody's going to beat me, I'm going to smash all these guys, it doesn't matter. Because you have to sort of keep a little, a little bit of humility to realize that you said it, this guy said he's beat seven UFC fighters, even though internally you can structure it so you know you're going to beat him, but he, he's still in the fight. Yeah, man. I mean, the, the guy's beaten seven UFC fighters. I can't screw around. But as far as competition is concerned, I'm already 1-0 against him. So, like, can I beat him? Yes, of course I can beat him. I've already beaten him in grappling. And that was in an art where I'm not able to strike this guy, and my striking's yeah, yeah. very high level. So, you know, I feel very confident about the matchup. The training camp we've put together already has been great. I've been in basically camp since April, so it's been a long training camp. Um, I was supposed to fight in uh, in July, and uh, my opponent pulled out, and then I had some some issues that I, I had to kind of train around for a while. But I never stopped training, kept it pretty high because uh, AJ was fighting in Bellator, so we just went right into basically getting him ready for Bellator. So man performance wise and like growth wise I feel like I'm much better than I was the last time I stepped in the octagon I'm a lot more confident which is strange coming off of the first loss I've had in the UFC the only loss I've had in the UFC and yeah so to feel like more confident is is strange but it's genuine like that's how I actually I feel know. you know it's, it, it is almost weird like dude there's no way you actually feel like that I'm like well fuck you I do <laughs> it's funny you can joke about it we spoke about this briefly before uh, this is a great segue to you just mentioned your only loss in the UFC UFC 297 uh, I think it was a pretty much of a shocking loss your opponent Neil Magny you were I don't know if dominates the right word uh, but you're definitely in control for the majority of well over two rounds and then you still lost the fight uh, that's gotta be devastating at some level and I wonder how do you get past that or do you get past that do you use it as fuel do you use that something just as an anomaly or what's what are your thoughts on that like of course it stings man anytime you fall you know you, you come up short there's no way that's going to feel good and and I don't know what's better you know getting worked in a fight and losing or or working a guy for 13 and a half minutes and then he finds a way to to win um, <clears throat> so it stings in a way more so immediately after the fight, especially when I couldn't train. I think a lot of 
the, the getting past a loss is being able to correct what you felt you need improvement on, which is, like I said, what I've been doing since before April. That first month of kind of recovery, because I was a little banged up in, in you know, my body, I needed to take some time just to recover. So that was the most difficult part where it's like, you just got to hurry up and wait for your body to get better and, and not rush back in. Now that I'm able to be in the practice room and, you know, have great days and have days that are, that are tough that you have to grind through, I'm definitely past the feelings from that fight. I, I want to go out there and have another great performance to just get past that, you know, and back on the, on, on the winning path. But as important as that is, the most important thing is, is growing and fixing the things that led to the loss in that fight, which is what I've been focused on for the last, what was that, you know, six to eight months. <clears throat> which is what in this case? I'm going to keep that to myself. You know, I don't want to get into that and kind of give things, give things away. Sure. Um, but man, I feel like there's been a lot of growth since then. And you know, with a fight like that, where it's like as devastating as it is to be in control of the fight, like you said, people are like you were dominating. I'm like, I wasn't beating the shit out of him, but like I clearly felt, I, I felt yeah. like I was the better fighter of the two yeah. of us for sure. And then to have it slip away, you're like, God damn it. Like, so close. Uh, ah, man, like I'm better than that guy. I can beat that guy. I was beating him the whole time. I can, I can do that. You know, I can, I can win. I can, I, I can beat this guy. But at the same time, on my opponent, on Magny's side of things, the dude has more wins than anybody at welterweight. The guy's got like seven hours of cage time. The guy holds records. More wins than anybody at welterweight. Most wins by decision in UFC history. You know, he's been in there with the best guys again and again. So, like, he does, it's, it's almost more annoying losing to him because he doesn't have any one thing where you're like, yo, watch out for that power. Or, yeah. man, he's elite on the ground he's just really good at fighting and being comfortable in uncomfortable positions composure his composure is excellent um so with magni i think m most of the things that he's great at obviously he's a technical fighter grappler good striker this and that but he's got so many x factors that are like hard almost intangibles you know it's not like Man, watch out for his right hand. There's just like, yeah. he's got a lot of things that he does really well that's like in between. It's like hard to label, but he's good at it, you know? Um, so yeah, and, and he's just so experienced. So um, it's not like I lost to some chump. It's a guy who, who's been in there countless yeah. times. Yeah. But uh, again, I'm just putting it back on myself as far as like my next fight, I feel more selfish about my motivation for the fight, I guess. Like, it's, it's back on being a little more about my own journey rather than the last fight. I felt like I let the pressure of being the torchbearer for Canada... I feel like I let that be a little more of a, of a fuel for me, and I... I I maybe thought about that a little bit more th than I should have. Whereas, like I'm saying, I'm putting it back on myself. I'm like, look, man, it's just cool to fight in the UFC. You know, yeah. of course I want to win. Of course I have intentions. Of course I have expectations for myself. But this is just a cool thing I get to do. So, so enjoy the process and don't be so hard on yourself and don't pressure yourself so much, you know? Yeah. You are... <clears throat> One thing I really appreciate about you and I, I commented to you before is your verbalization, it's almost a continuous verbalization of your thought process and talking to yourself about the highs and the lows and how that ties into just your normal state of being, right? Like as, a, as a, a person, not even just as a fighter, any person, we have highs and lows every day. You know, this worked, that didn't work. Uh, some days are better than others. And you, you really talk about that with yourself just to sort of normalize it, I guess. And I think, is that something you learned from Danny as well? Yeah. Danny Patterson, my mental coach has helped me with this a lot because it's really easy to let a bad day or a bad session or even a bad round, bad week, whatever, get you down and you're like, man, what? You know, it's, it's funny. Mike Tyson talks about it too where, where there are some, you know, you're walking out to the fight and, or you're in the back and 
part of you is like, what the fuck am I doing here? I'm a fraud. And then the next thought you have is like, I am an untouchable God. Nobody can fuck with me. Like I am going to destroy whoever this is. And you have these like ups and downs and you have some of those as far as performance in the room. So just normalizing, like you're saying that, that, uh, that stuff happens to everybody. Like if you're not losing rounds in the gym, you either must be so specialized and, and elite at what you're doing that no one in the world can touch you. You must be like a John Jones. Though I'm sure there he brings you guys in that can make him struggle at, in certain aspects. Or I think you shelter yourself too much to where you're not challenged. And I think that stunts your growth. I think a lot of people, once they get to a certain level, don't want to lose anymore. And it, it I think it stunts their growth. There's some, some guys, I'm not going to name any names, but I... I see some guys in fights, especially some guys that I kind of know, but not close with, but I'm like, you need to, you need to push yourself more, man, or you need to be trained with different guys, or you need to get out of your comfort zone, like, um, that's a great lesson in life for everybody, like, if you want to succeed in life, if you want to be very successful at something, you have to challenge yourself, and you have to, got to take that risk, you might lose with that risk, but that's part of the, part of life. I mean, you might lose anyway, man, all you can do is... Is, is try to find ways to grow. I'm not going to get into... Yeah, I won't get into what we talked about earlier about the last fight, but... Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to get into what we said earlier. Well, neither am I. And in fact, I think that's probably a great time to end the interview. Uh, unless there's anything else you want to bring up, Mike, that I forgot to mention. Um, yes, the so uh, STC Skilled Trades College, the uh, Building Champions program... So they're uh, giving 12, 12 applicants a, f a full ride for, uh, for, for, for an STC program. So, uh, you know, apply. You can apply as many times as you want. And uh, it's a great opportunity to, to better your life. And if, you know, if, if skilled trades are something that you're interested in doing, this is an opportunity to learn a skill that's in high demand at all times like these things are always going to be necessary whether the economy's high the economy's low we're in a recession we're you know whatever it is this is stuff that's always going to be needed and there's always going to be a, a market for that stuff so yeah, yeah apply now and, and uh you know maybe you win man i will put the uh details for the skilled trades college program in the uh description of the video below mike you thank you mike you Mike, thank you very much. I always appreciate the time. Uh, best of luck November 2nd. We're rooting for you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. Here you go, fight friends. Have fun and enjoy the fights.